to propose uh, the welcome address. May I welcome Bhama. Good morning all, it gives me great pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome on behalf of the Inter-University Center for Alternative Economics for the second technical session. We would indeed honored to have Professor A.V. Jones, Honorary Fellow, Center for Development Studies, Trivandrum, to chair the session. Welcome, sir. We also have with us here today Professor Patrini Swaminathan, a well-known feminist economist. She is currently the chairperson of the Center for uh, Livelihood and Development at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad former director of Madras Institute of Development Studies and chair of regional studies of the RBA, Professor Padmini Swaminathan, studies industrial organization, labor education, and health from a gender perspective. Welcome, ma'am. <laughs> Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Anita V, reader, Department of Economics, University of Kerala, and Dr. Christabella P.J., assistant professor, Department of Future Studies, University of Kerala, who will be presenting the papers, the session. Once again, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you present here. Thank you. I request the Chair, Professor Avi Jones, to start the proceedings. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I'm afraid you will soon get tired of seeing my face here. So let me not do, let me not uh, invite trouble. Straight get into the business. And as you know, the chairperson's main job is to stay as the timekeeper. That means we have allocated half an hour to Professor Patmini Swaminathan and then there will be 15 minutes each for the next two presenters, uh, two groups, and altogether we will set aside an hour for the presentations and hopefully after that half an hour for debate on the issues raised by these eminent speakers. So onward to Patmini Swaminathan. Professor Jose is in a different avatar and he's become very conscious of time now. <laughs> okay. uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to give an elaborate thank you, but thank you, IUCA, for inviting me here. Uh, what is my presentation uh, all about? The title is there uh, for all of you to uh, see. And let me also tell you where is this title coming from and why I have given this particular uh, title. Uh, it is part of a project that I have uh, undertaken, uh, not funded by anybody, it's my own uh, project. And that is, uh, I thought it is time having uh, uh, you know, served a considerable number of years in another, another research institute and having been part of the uh, women's movement and so on and so forth. Uh, I actually started asking myself, having worked on issues of gender, uh, so, what is it that we have achieved as uh, people who have worked on gender and how has gender been done uh, in all these years in different aspects of our, uh, of our life? So that was, the, that was the question that I asked myself and uh, uh, I won't go into details of that. There are two parts of this particular study and one part of that study is a review of existing literature uh, to sketch the multiple ways in which scholars researching on India have attempted to do uh, gender. And I, came, and I came to this term of doing gender, uh, as I mentioned already in my uh, abstract, that uh, I, I was quite fascinated by a series of articles uh, that, uh, uh, that was published in the journal Gender and Society, where uh, scholars, uh, uh, you know, were looking at uh, in, uh, and, and largely in the Western context, how gender has been done. So between 1987 and 2009, there was, uh, 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 you know, there was a, some kind of a evaluation uh, done uh, by scholars as to a seminal article that was written in 1987 uh, about doing gender. And in 2009, they revisited this particular uh, uh, program of doing gender to actually find out how gender has been done. And one of, I mean, uh, there are very interesting take about how uh, how this has been done. But the seminal uh, point that came out of this kind of an evaluation was that um, uh, that between 1987 when that article was written and 2009 when uh, uh, when an evaluation was done, it was found that the uh, the feminist edge in doing gender, which was to bring about gender equality 
that had gone away and gender had become a very sanitized term where whatever groups of boys and girls did or men and women did was seen as doing gender. So, uh, uh, so the political edge, the feminist edge of critically looking at uh, why persistence, uh, there is persistence of gender inequality, that had, that had come down uh, quite a bit and uh, 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 you know, so there was some kind of a evaluation that was done about how did we understand, how did the state understand, how did scholars understand and so on and so forth. And therefore, uh, uh, I was quite fascinated by that, by that particular literature. And I thought like if we were to do that kind of an exercise in India about how gender has been done, then how would we go about it? And I, for myself, I kind of did it, uh, I thought about it in two parts. Uh, so one part of it is to do a review of literature of existing works that have been done across disciplines, uh, uh, across movements, uh, across departments of governments and so on and so forth. So that is an ongoing process uh, that is actually happening. And the second part of this whole exercise and on which today's discussion is based, uh, presentation is based, is uh, specifically aimed at capturing how the particular manner in which the Indian state has sought to uh, achieve economic development has had, has had very adverse consequences uh, for its agenda of uh, achieving gender justice. Uh, one of my, one of my um, points when I was looking at this gender in society uh, 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 you know, set of articles was that for many Western countries, you don't have to actually center stage the aspect of development so much as we have to do in our country. Because some of the things that that we are struggling for, that we are actually struggling for, education, health, sanitation, uh, public health, and all that, to some extent, I'm not saying everything is so fine, but to a large extent, these have been taken care of on many of these uh, developed countries. Uh, but when we are talking about doing gender in our country, we have to uh, we have to forefront the issue of development, and therefore, my entire presentation. Uh, today uh, will be focused on how, how if you were to focus this aspect of development on to this aspect of doing gender, what what are the what is the scenario that comes uh, 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 you know that that, uh, that actually uh, confronts us? So how have I gone about this particular uh, uh, particular uh, issue? Uh, uh, I'll flag. Uh, I am using as illustration uh, the uh, the social sector of our country. Because uh, 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 to, uh, to illustrate my point that rather than developing working for women, it is actually women working for development. So a large part of the development that the country is supposed to be doing for its citizens is actually premised about how how women are made to work for development. Largely women. Some some men are also made to work for development, but a large part of women are made work for development. So I am actually making the point that rather than development working for women, it is actually women working for development. And that is how I am going to use the social sector to actually uh, illustrate uh, uh, illustrate this particular point. Um, uh, so what are the things, uh, uh, you know, what are, what are the issues in the social sector that I am actually going to take? So I am going to take the sector of health, uh, and of education to actually illustrate uh, uh, to illustrate my uh, point. Uh, what I also do uh, uh, is also quote from certain official reports that we have to also tell you that it is not only the women's movement or certain women scholars sitting here, there, and with, you know uh, doing this kind of a work. But if you were to seriously also read government of India documents. Uh, uh, you will also come across and uh, uh, come across how the government, uh, uh, how the government actually is, uh, you know, justifying what what it is actually doing. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take the report of the midterm appraisal of the 11th plan of the planning commission, which is a uh, 2000. Uh, the, uh, the 11th plan is 2007 to 2012. And this midterm appraisal was done somewhere in 2011, and the report was published in 2012. So uh, after that, as you know, we don't have the planning commission anymore. So this is the official document that we have, and it's a good enough document for us to actually 
uh, uh, look into the kind of issues that I'm actually uh, 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 going to raise. So one, one of the things that, uh, uh, that this particular document does on the health sector, it has a, uh, 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 you know, it's, it, these official documents are tedious readings, but as researchers we need to engage with them if we have to take on, uh, 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 you know, seriously what our governments are doing and uh, how they portray the, some of these particular issues. So what I did was I actually read the uh, uh, chapter on health, and one of the one of the things that came comes out very 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 clearly is this uh, urgency of the ASHA program of the government of India. Uh, uh, under the NRHM scheme and so on. This is a flagship program of the government of India and the ASHA program is a, is a very important program right across our country. And one of the things that, um, that, uh, that the document also points out, it has very interesting tables which tells us uh, how many ASHAs have been recruited. So huge number. So it runs into a couple of lakhs of workers who have been recruited as uh, uh, ASHA workers. <coughs> Now, if you read between the lines of this particular document, what it also tells us, and that is what I'm going to actually tell you, and these are important things uh, for us. Uh, in the last session, we were talking about how we need to struggle for some of our rights. So this is going to be some of the struggles that we actually have to do. Because what the document also says, why it says why so many lakhs of people have been recruited as ASHA workers, it also tells us the following. Uh, it tells us that and I'm quoting from the Planning Commission document, it says, it has been reported that due to contractual recruitments with NRHM funds, uh, states have uh, added you know, so many specialists. So they run into some several thousands uh, of specialists that have been actually uh, recruited. Uh, and what it also says is that as contractual appointments are facilitated, under the NRHM funds, contractual appointments are facilitated the states tend to decrease their sanction post. It must therefore be ensured by the states that they will, in the long run, bear the expenditure for such contractual appointments. So what is, what is it that the message that this planning commission document is telling us? That the contractual appointments are here to stay. And over a period of time, the sanction posts are going to come down. So this is something which is which you can read between the lines of the uh, planning commission uh, documents. So that is one part of the thing. It's an official admission that it is these are contractual appointments are going to stay, and there is going to be it's going to impact on over a period of time the sanction post in the uh, country. What is the second issue that the uh, the planning commission um, is telling us is that um, so there is a. There is a take on why they are recruiting these ashas who are local people who know the area and so on, blah, blah, blah. So there is a lot of material on uh, you know, why, why they are recruiting people from the uh, uh, local uh, this thing. So, but what we, what, what we uh, do not tell us is that the, these people are not recognized as workers. So when I am not recognized as a worker, the law of the land that applies to all workers in the country does not apply to these people at all, right? And they are therefore paid an honorarium, or they are considered as voluntary workers, and, and that is it. So so what happens is that I, I, I am here as an ASHA worker to do all the health work of, that the government imposes on me, or the state government tells me to do periodically, uh, you know, keeps adding to my burden of work but I am not recognized as a worker. I am paid bits and pieces for the kind of work that I do. And I, I don't, I am a voluntary worker, and so I am paid a particular honor. So, uh, so, uh, so this is the situation, and, and that is why I am saying that the health, health work of the government of India, health work of the states of our country, is done by the women, and they are working for development. The development is not actually working for them. The, the development that happens to them is they get that particular honor right? Uh, so that, that, that is how I'm interpreting this particular thing. That is the official Planning Commission document. What I've done is that I've also looked at studies that have done uh, 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 on ground reality of the functioning of the ASHA program. When you put together an official data and you also look 
it along with field studies that have been conducted. And that is what feminist methodology tells you, is that you can combine this quantitative information that you get from the Planning Commission, and you also look at studies that look at it from a very political uh, you know, you know, aspect. You get a much more richer understanding of what really is happening uh, on the ground. And I, I'm not, for want of time, I will not go into the details. But on the ground, I have looked at a couple of studies, uh, ethnographic studies that have been done. Uh, and in, in, in several states of our country, in Rajasthan, in Orissa, in Jharkhand, uh, and so on and so forth. So one of the studies that was done in Rajasthan, actually it tells us is, uh, is a, uh, an important detail captured in the study, and this is an ethnographic. So the person is going, talking to the ASHA worker, and asking her, what is your work? What is it that you actually do? And then also talks to the officials at the local level, and asks them, what is the work that the ASHA worker is supposed to do? And you just, I just, I just quickly list out to you what are they supposed to do. You know, an important detail captured in this particular study is a range of work that the ASHAs are expected to perform to promote the various pieces of health advice of the Indian authority have notoriously promoted to the population. So these include compliance to the small family norm, a norm vaccination of children, seeking out health checkups during pregnancy, uh, giving birth in a hospital, exclusively breastfeed children for the first six months, use contraceptives and opt for sterilization of the two children, construct toilets and so on. So as the government programs go on increasing in the name of health, the, the burden on the ASHA workers goes on increasing. And the work, uh, 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 and I'll come to the different study that actually captures for what are the things that they are paid and for what they are actually uh, uh, not paid. The, the other detail of the ethnographic thing which is very important is that the, the planning commission document just says that the ASHA workers don't get their money on time and therefore we need to speed up, we need to ask them to open bank accounts, we need to transfer money. So there is an official speak on how they should be compensated. But on the ground the scenario is slightly more complex. On the ground the scenario is that the ASHA worker now is pitted against the ward boys and the nurses who think they, these people are taking away the money that is actually due to them. If the ASHA worker accompanies the pregnant women to the hospital, then, uh, then the ward boys and the other and the nurses who are there may lose some bit of the money that they could have gotten. It is the ASHA worker has to get the signature of the nurse or the head nurse or whoever it is to be able to avail of that particular money that is due to her if she accompanies a particular pregnant woman for institutional delivery. Uh, that is a substantial amount, like 400 rupees, if she go to that, you know, uh, into the institutional delivery. But to get that signature, she's made to run up and down. And very often, the nurses tell the pregnant women, "You don't, you, you come on your own. Don't bring, don't come with the ASHA worker." So on the ground, something else is happening. But in the official planning commission document, it is simply that you open an account, you put the transfer, the money. This has to be done fast, and so on and so forth. So there is a disjunction between what is happening on the ground and what is happening in the, uh, at the, uh, at the district. Uh, there is a, I, I'll just quickly also uh, 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 tell you about another study which is very important, uh, uh, which, was, which is a survey that was done in Maharashtra in a particular district about who are these ASHA workers and what is the kind of work that they have to do. And uh, 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 you know, this is, these are all published in EPW, so they are uh, available, I don't have to give you. But for my purpose, what is it that, that I wanted to tell you is that, uh, this is a study by Kavita Bhatia uh, in 2014, and uh, 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 you know, and what she points out is that the, she asked the workers, 244 ASHA workers were asked to list uh, what are the kinds of responsibilities that they have, and each one of them independently they were asked to do, and roughly you found that they had 20 responsibilities. So this 244 people collectively said, uh, listed about 220 responsibilities, but just five tasks are paid, right? So they have 20 responsibilities, and only five tasks were paid uh, uh, the same. Uh, uh, so this is the this is the way in which this is the reason why I'm saying these women are made to work for development rather than the development uh, 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 working uh, uh, working for them. The other other thing that um, uh, uh, you know, it is also important is that is that you are taking people from the community who are actually marginalized within some level of literacy 
and who think of this is, why are they taking up this job? Is that they think that at some point in their life, they will become formalized worker, they will be inducted into the government service as health workers and so on and so forth. As we know from the planning commission documents, sanction posts are not going to come. So these are going to remain contractual, uh, these are going to remain contractual. But the initial investment that has to be done for ASHA workers to go from one place to another, to do many things, the investment has to come from them. And it takes an enormous amount of time for the government to actually reimburse these people. And many ASHA workers have actually uh, spoken to these researchers and told them that the families, the, uh, some families are supportive, not many families are supportive, because they feel that the burden is too much and the compensation that is paid to these workers is very, very uh, less. But despite that, we have these lakhs and lakhs of ASHA workers who are actually there in our, uh, in our system. The other sector that I want to talk to you about is the education sector. And this, like the health sector, is another one which has a whole institution called the Parateachers Institution. And uh, uh, um, there are men also who are working. There are a large number of men also who are working as uh, Parateachers. And uh, once again, what has happened is uh, we have studies uh, uh, which have been done about where this institution of para teachers actually uh, came about, and and one of the things that uh, uh, that these studies actually point out is that this institution of para teachers, which is teachers on contract, and they are known by different terminologies in different parts of our country as Siksha Karmis, uh, Shiksha Mitra, Guruji, so on and so forth. This institution of para teachers is here to stay. Because once again, uh, once again, uh, the government of India has actually cut down on the finances that go for sanctioned posts. It is not increasing the number of sanctioned posts, and therefore, the institution of para teachers uh, is actually uh, uh, here to stay. And so, we have again, we have uh, quite a bit of studies uh, which actually tell us, uh, 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 tell us that. Uh, what is the kind of what is the kind of salaries that uh, 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 the the rationality given for para teachers? One of the rationality given for para teachers is that the regular teachers don't come on time; they are absent, uh, they don't teach, uh, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But the para teachers are bang on time; they teach, some learning is happening, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the question that, as researchers and as social scientists, we need to ask ourselves is is that why don't we analytically segregate some of these issues? All of us as teachers have to teach. I mean, that's that's part of our thing. And if I don't teach, I, I you know, I am a faculty at this Hyderabad, and if I don't teach, I need to be hauled up for not teaching. You cannot say you are not teaching, therefore I remove the sanction post and I replace it by a party teacher's post. And that is the deep rational the way in which the government of India is going about. Because time and again, politicians are saying, para teachers are, uh, uh, you know, teaching. Uh, some learning is happening, but with the regular teachers there. So what has happened in our country is that the regular teachers have be have been pitted against the para teachers. And the larger issue of why this country is not able to get resources for education, if that is a very important phenomenon, why this country is not able to get resources uh, for uh, 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 you know education and earmark resources for education is not being actually uh, looked into. That discussion happens at a very different level. The issue of finances, the issue of how the devolution of resources go on between uh, plan and non-plan and so on and so forth, uh, that has caused a lot of uh, problem in our country. And that is discussed at a very different level by public uh, finance officials. And that discussion does not come into this whole business of para teachers and regular teachers. So the point I want to make it here also is that very often, analytically, we are not segregating issue of economics from the issue of social justice. Both are important, but we are not saying para teachers have to be regular because of social justice issue. We are also saying that there are real economic issues that need to be actually looked at as to why state governments after state government in our country is actually going in for more para teachers and not going in for regular teachers. There is a serious issue of financial resources uh, and this devolution of resources between plan and plan, uh, non-plan that actually needs to be uh, um, that needs to be addressed. So you, uh, I mean, if I have to give you some dimension about, uh, I mean, one of the articles that uh, uh, Geeta Nambisan and uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, Rao have written in a, in a paper in 2010. So they are saying that all states pay paraticheers a fraction of their regular counterparts. In West Bengal, for example, paraticheers were paid just 14% of the wages of regular teachers in 2007. So you, you know, this is the pittance that one is talking about of what the paraticheers are paid. But more or less the job that they do is equal to uh, the regular uh, teachers. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, the other side, the other uh, uh, I want uh, you know the story can be repeated in several other sectors. Uh, yeah, it could be uh, as anganwadi uh, ang uh, anganwadi workers, midday meal workers, and so on and so forth. Uh, in both the planning commission documents and in, in the nature of research that has been done, uh, uh, micro level research that has been done in our country. Time and again, again, it has been pointed out how how all of these people, the anganwadi workers and the midday meal workers, uh, are being paid an honor only. So once again, all of these people are not workers uh, in any sense of the word, and so no, uh, hardly any kind of labor legislation applies to these workers. They may have unions, they may be fighting. And regularly, for example, in the Tamil Nadu midday meal scheme, the Tam Tamil Nadu thing is a model for other countries to be adopted. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Supreme Court has said that this model should be adop adopted, made universal, so on and so forth. So it is talking about the phenomenon of how children need to be given a hot meal uh, at 12 noon. So that is what it is. But there is a complete silence about who are these people who are producing this meal and who are these workers and they are a parallel bureaucracy. So in Tamil Nadu you are looking at something like 5 lakh workers uh, who are struggling, who have a union and periodically what happens is when the government increases DA or when the government increases resources for its employees, some, some percentage is increased by these but these are not regular government employees. So once again, you have a phenomenon where these people are actually helping our, uh, uh, you know, country uh, for increasing nutritional status of children, but they are working for development. The development, you know, of the country is not actually uh, uh, working uh, uh, working for them. Okay. So my 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 the the other part of what I tried to do was. Uh, uh, in, in, in this particular uh, project that I'm, I'm looking at is, is that how does education, for example, how does the phenomenon of education get translated or is understood on the ground? The reason why I try to look at this particular phenomenon is, no, none of us here sitting here would say education is not important for girls, or you know, we, we would not be saying that. At the same time, when you look at some, uh, some figures, where you find that the age at marriage of women of girls is coming down. Uh, you know, when you look at this particular phenomenon, we, we thought we had addressed this issue of age at marriage of girls. There are legal distinctions. We thought over a period of time with the women's movement, sensitizing people and so on and so forth, we have, we have actually addressed some of these particular issues. That we may not want to revisit some of these particular issues. And yet you find there are field-based studies that are coming up with different kind of scenarios and these are very interesting uh, studies and much more empirically based field work will have to be done to address some of these particular uh, development issues. One of them what I called in the title as education and status production. Uh, this is from a paper that has been written by Clarinda Still in 2011, I think it is in Modern Asian Studies. Uh, where where this person, where this scholar has actually stayed with this particular uh, 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 Dalit community and has actually studied, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a section of the Dalit community that has had education and that has actually moved upwards, you know, what we would call as upward mobility. But what is the nature of this upward mobility? And that is something that, that is very important for us to actually think about. And uh, and that is where I think what the women's movement has done is constantly hammered us the point is the women's movement is not homogeneous. So you have you have a very heterogeneous uh, uh, set of people that we are talking about. So this whole phenomenon of education is good for girls for their upward mobility for them to get in, uh, 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 into better jobs and so on and so forth. 
uh, on the ground, the scenario that could present us could be something very, very uh, different. So what has this, uh, this scholar actually uh, actually found when she was researching among this section of the of the Dalit community that is upwardly uh, mobile. So what what this uh, uh, is that the the understanding of the feminist movement is that the Dalit community because they are in paid employment they are working in agriculture they are outside the home they are far more liberated than middle class housewives who are confined into the home and. What, what Clarinda still finds uh, in her particular uh, study in this particular community is that as soon as there is some kind of a mobility upwards, the Dalit women or the, uh, the, uh, the, other, uh, the younger generation is getting married into a, uh, uh, into a family uh, which has got a class four uh, uh, you know, uh, employment in the government. The first thing is to get out of paid employment and be a Okay. Because that for them, and why is that? Is that because it is interpreted as an escape from a demeaning work which is agriculture, which is a back breaking, demeaning agricultural work. So, what you are doing is that you are actually escaping from that by getting out of paid employment. And that actually poses a dilemma to the feminist movement because how do I interpret this? Because our understanding is that education should enable me to move out of the house and get into paid employment. And here you have a community of people who have been working in paid employment. And when there is an upward mobility, the, the, the phenomenon is to get out of that kind of a, a work and get into a business. The second kind of interpretation that they have given for doing this is saying that the middle class people have all these years actually enjoyed mothering, looking after their children, uh, you know, teaching them homework, taking them for several uh, extra uh, extracurricular activities, uh, seeing to it that they are investing in their children for upward mobility of their children. We have not had the occasion to do all of this. And when we have upward mobility, we want to be at home and we want to do the things that has been done for the middle class people of the country. So there is a very different, uh, 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 different understanding that some of the some of these people are bringing to their particular education, and to me that is a very fascinating phenomenon because that really actually poses a huge dilemma for feminist uh, uh, understanding of what education. That hitherto we have been having this very linear understanding that with education you should do this, move upwards, get you know all of that, and here are people telling us something very very different. So that is one kind of literature that is actually coming out. And the second kind of, so there are different scenarios across the country. So a second kind of studies, second set of studies that have been done is that education is a very risky business is what parents are interpreting. Why are they interpreting education as a very risky business? Because in villages where I am, I may have an 8 standard, at the most I'll have a 10 standard. But if I have to move beyond, I have to leave the village and I have to stay somewhere else. And, and that means that the, there is no control over the daughter, over the sexuality of the daughter. The daughter is out and, and the chances of the daughter eloping, getting into a different kind of a marriage is huge and therefore parents are interpreting it as education is a very risky business. So what has happened is that there are micro levels. I'm not saying this phenomenon is one doesn't know because because our data systems, large data systems, are not looking into some of these kinds of phenomena. They are only capturing, you know, who, who is where, how much, by what percentage it has increased, and so on and so forth. So these are questions that are being asked at a very different level. And what they are actually finding out is that there are many families that are actually withdrawing children and not allowing them and getting them married at a, uh, just to escape any kind of caste, this thing. Uh, uh, you know, fear of the girls marrying into a very different caste or eloping and so on and so forth. So a couple of these studies that I, uh, uh, you know, I have had a chance to look at actually start from case studies of girls uh, who have been brought back uh, uh, and confined to home and, and forcibly married uh, within their caste whose studies have been actually stopped. So, so therefore, uh, 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 therefore, when I am studying, when I am studying uh, uh, education, and I am actually saying how education is very important, particularly for the marginalized community, if they get out of uh, uh, their marginalization and move upwards, 
Uh, there is also this phenomenon that one has to contend with is that, uh, 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 you know, how do you address these kinds of, uh, 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 this kind of phenomenon. Okay, I'll just conclude, uh, I'll just conclude with uh, 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 just two points. One is, I just wanted to flag for you a study that was done by uh, Vishwajit Ghosh, which is published in Social Change, uh, which actually points out, uh, as per the 2001 census, it actually points out how in the, uh, uh, among the 19 districts of West Bengal, uh, Malda had the highest, uh, second highest percentage of child marriage in the state after Mushinabha. Right. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so these are these are phenomena that we actually have to, uh, 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 you know, address uh, uh, as to what is really happening. And one of the things that Bosch also captures is that after a 10 standard, after a 12 standard, what is the econ what is the prospect that the economy is providing in terms of employment? What are the avenues for employment that is close to my home? After a 10th or a 12th, what is, what is it that I'm able to do? So, and therefore this fear of also that if I have to, uh, uh, you know, invest more in education of girls, uh, 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 you know, for what is it am I leading them to? Uh, uh, you know, what are the prospects that they have uh, after this particular education? Uh, these are serious questions that we, we have to uh, address. So my last class point that I, uh, I actually want to, uh, 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 you know, I want to say is that the state gets away by designating some of the welfare programs as having been instituted to empower women. In the absence of such programs, the argument goes, women currently employed would not have had access to the remuneration that they now receive. Uh, most studies evaluating such programs are generally caught up in measuring in what manner the implementation of these programs have or have not empowered women. That such programs are another facet of the ways in which Indian women subsidize the Indian economy is one part of the story. More significant for labor economic studies is the question of how does one confront the Indian state that is at once the arbiter on issues concerning violation of labor laws, but is also the defaulter when it comes to hiring personnel for its own programs. For the women's movement in the country, continued material deprivation of large numbers of households combined with suboptimal solutions as represented by our ashas, para teachers, midday meal workers, can by no stretch of imagination take us closer to the lofty ideals espoused by the 1995 Raging Platform for Action that was to ensure that the concerns for women and gender issue should not remain marginal to the ideas and practices of development organizations, but should be central to them and hence located in their mainstream. So all these years we were talking about gender mainstreaming and this is where we have actually reached. So it is our contention that the hope through the interaction of development and gender, change could be produced has not been realized. I'm not saying change has not happened, but it is not necessarily the kind of change that we actually uh, hope for. Moreover, the continuing challenge for feminist scholars and activists on the ground is a perennial need to track the consequences of actions taken as well as those not taken. I do not believe that we have not periodically changed the questions that we have or should be asking. However, all our attempts thus far has failed to make development, reach state accountable to the agenda of gender justice, without which the project of doing gender, which includes the phenomenon of making development work for women and children of this country, will remain unfinished and therefore on. Uh, I hope we will have an opportunity to talk at length this, uh, these issues and let me, let me request uh, the second speaker, um, Dr. Anita, um, to make a presentation. Of seats in all located, particularly women, benefited through the uh, reservation system 
and uh, one of the uh, noted thing is that most of the people are most of the women are come under the category low class and low caste the country in uh, kerala contest we have completed 20 years of uh, decentralization and the reservation system and compared to other other states kerala ranks uh, kerala's position is comparatively better in the case of women and scheduled caste and scheduled rice and if we analyze the literature related to the uh, position within the Kerala, we can see that uh, compared to the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, uh, the position of women is increasing compared to the previous years. So it, this shows that uh, Kerala faces, still Kerala fa faces some problem related to the caste system. So in this context, the research question here arises with whether mandatory reservation created through participation from scheduled caste to scheduled tribe community has it created social justice among that means democratic justice among the uh, this particular community. So the major objective is to explore the actual outcome and byproducts of the community reservation in care. So the analytical context is that the political empowerment, the literature shows that the political empowerment can be measured through the uh, process of decision making process or the capacity to contribute to the decision making and uh, uh, the, uh, the major factors influencing the decision making capacity of an individual is the uh, self-confidence, self-esteem, then freedom, capability to uh, expect new things and uh, uh, so many uh, factors are there. See, and if we assess the well-being or the happiness or the satisfaction level of an individual, all these variables are indirectly related to the satisfaction level. And if we exclude, being excluded from any of these social relations, uh, according to Amartya Sen, that's the situation of social exclusion. So, social exclusion is a, uh, again, uh, he classified, uh, there are different dimensions of social exclusion, positive and active exclusion. If we do not uh, uh, protect a particular law, that means that without any law, we exclude a particular group, we can call it as a positive exclusion. See, the measurement for the um, uh, individual empowerment, if you have the, I would like to measure the individual empowerment, particularly the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe community, with the mainstream women representatives. And uh, I have uh, uh, used the three categories, scheduled, uh, scheduled caste, scheduled tribe women community, scheduled tribe, uh, SCST male community, and uh, uh, compare it with the SCST, uh, sorry, non-SCST women. So if, if, if a field survey is conducted, uh, through the 14 district and the, all the local set governments and the uh, life satisfaction approach is used for the analyzing the satisfaction level of the uh, uh, representatives and recently the economist, it is an alternative method of measuring the well-being of an individual, recently the economist used this principle for measuring the happiness or the sat uh, satisfaction, uh, particularly uh, the Deacon and the uh, Pearson uh, space and are all used for analyzing the sat different satisfaction level and the environment <coughs> economists also use the sat life satisfaction approach. Here I have used the candle self-anchoring scale, the same uh, uh, scale used by the detail uh, in, for the study and the details are also conducted. The major variables analyzed here are social economic characteristics, political background, details of position in local self-governance, self-governance, self-respect and respect from others individual empowerment or the ability, freedom, decision-making capacity, satisfaction, capacity to convey ideas. See, these are the few tables. Uh, the table sh uh, shows the relationship between uh, comparison of uh, SCST male and SCST female uh, regarding the decision-making capacity. We can see that uh, compared to uh, SCST female, SCST male have a uh, greater advantage in the decision-making capacity. And then if you compare SCST male with a non-SCST female, uh, here a non-SCST female has an advantage in the case of decision-making capacity. Then compare SCST male and non-SCST male, here again non-SCST male has a more capacity in the case of decision-making. Then the comparison of satisfaction level, which are rep uh, rep uh, again the, uh, the different the representatives, it shows that uh, compared to female, SCST male has a more uh, satisfaction uh, level. And again, if we compare SCST male with a non-SCST male, we can see that non-SCST male, uh, their satisfaction is very high. 
And if we again compare STST male with a non STST uh, female, the satisfaction level of female, non STST female is greater than the STST male. Then the differences in life satisfaction are representatives. The dependent variable is taken as the life satisfaction ladder. And uh, I have used so many uh, empowerment variables, but due to some errors, I can drop so many variables. But still, there are a lot of variables related or related with the dependent variable that is the life satisfaction ladder. And the one a major variable is previous experiences in the political field. Uh, then I uh, income. The income means here the income is taken as the income affected due to the position in the local state governments. Uh, this is uh, in the case of SCST female, it is noted that a negative value. Even though it is negative value, its uh, uh, significance is very high. That means the, uh, due to the position in the local self-government, uh, uh, females coming under the category SCSC, their, their satisfaction is negative. Because the situation is that most of the women engage in casual work, due to the position in the uh, local self-governments, most of the time they drop their casual work. Then in the case of age, I can't see some any relationship between SCSC male and SCSC female, but in the case of uh, non scsc female it is significant and the decision making capacity it is uh, high uh, significant in the case of scsc male and the ability to uh, convey ideas in the public there is relationship with the scsc male and the uh, scsc female and the ability to change things in one's life is no, uh, it is uh, related with the SCS, uh, non scsc female then freedom see this freedom the concept is entirely different so we have asked different questions in the questionnaire uh, freedom to move, freedom to uh, take decisions. But this freedom uh, shows uh, the, the freedom when we come to the uh, particular position, what freedom you enjoy. Then the uh, satisfaction, see, there is a relationship between uh, the non SCSC uh, female, female satisfaction level and the uh, freedom. But we can't see any uh, relationship with the others. So the major findings is that previous experience is high among non SCSC females. See, regarding the self-confidence and the respect from other representatives, we can see that uh, the non scsc female enjoys uh, self high self-confidence compared to uh, SCSC male and SCSC female. Then the respect from the society, but in the case of respect from the society, the situation is uh, very opposite. SCSC female, they say that their, their respect is increased in the society uh, compared to SCSC male and the non scsc female. Then the decision making capacity and the satisfaction level we can in both cases we can see that non scsc female is uh, their decision making capacity and the satisfaction level is high compared to scsc male and scsc female then the uh, life satisfaction approach which shows that uh, previous experience in the political field decision making capacity ability to convey ideas in the public ability to change things in one's life are the major variables influencing the life satisfaction approach so from this we can see that the uh, Panchayati Raj institutions or the uh, 73rd amendment they created fundamental changes and that fundamental change is a necessary condition for the uh, empowerment of uh, um, socially excluded people or the marginalized community but that's not a sufficient condition. See, uh, then why, how we can uh, uh, develop a sufficient condition we need a transformation in the leadership position. That means uh, transformation in the form of leadership from the uh, power to the powerless. Power to the powerless means male to female, uh, female to uh, the backward communities and like that. So how can we uh, uh, develop such a condition that's a very uh, severe question. See, we can see that in the, I mean, most of the cases in Kerala, the practice is that uh, some, uh, there is a clash between the constitutional uh, provisions and the uh, uh, community principles. So most of the time we can face some uh, such clash, uh, clashes. So uh, a concerted effort must be taken from the, must be, uh, be, be given um, from the, our part. So uh, the immediate solution we can see that uh, maybe we can develop some leadership qualities through continuous training and we can change the, uh, uh, we can change the transformation through the changes in the leadership pattern. go into psychometry, try to measure happiness and self-esteem. I mean, you know, one can only admire the boldness, the courage, 
in taking up such ventures. And I'm sure you will have an opportunity to raise questions about the methodology used in these studies, the conclusions arrived by them, and also its relevance to policy making in contemporary societies. We'll have an opportunity to look into these issues. Let me therefore request uh, the second speaker of the, uh, the century of the day, Dr. Christopher, Assistant uh, Professor, Department of Future Students, University. A very good afternoon to you all. Respected Chair, uh, Professor David Chisar, uh, Madam, and my dear colleagues, uh, and, and my dear students. Today, I'm trying to uh, give or speak from a really, a really different point of view, that is from the point of view of the commons. Kerala is rich in natural resources. And if you look at the natural resources, we can see that they are almost uh, all of them are the common property resources. And I'm trying to uh, put forward a hypothesis that the common property resources in Kerala are under uh, severe stress. And because of that, uh, the livelihood options of the people who are there in the state uh, is declining. For that, you know, I'm, I'm taking uh, you know, you know, orders, no data, nothing is there. I use a small case study in order to uh, explain uh, the convention. For that, you know, uh, this, uh, I acknowledge uh, the people who have helped me uh, while I prepare this, uh, this paper, uh, the photographers uh, who took beautiful photographs of uh, the Valiani Lake, which I have taken as uh, the case study, and the, and the discussion with the people who are there in the local area, and everybody uh, who has uh, helped me as we come about. To start with, uh, the basic idea of economics is about the optimal allocation of resources between different possible resources. But we all know that it is not that much easy, because when we try to plan, or when we try to allocate the resources, different uh, issues come up, or different factors come up, like social, political, legal, ecological, and, and uh, economic factors. They act simply, simply or, 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 uh, or in any combination, make it difficult to uh, allocate the resources in the proper manner. So uh, the traditional, the conventional economics uh, try to have an economic planning in order to have the maximum benefit to the society. And uh, when it comes to the environment management, you can see that we try to uh, allocate the resources using uh, environment planning, system uh, scattered evaluation, environment impact assessment, and, uh, and, and a whole lot of environmental uh, legislations. It is in the uh, large background that trying to fit the common property resources, which can be defined as resources accessible to the whole community, to which no individual has exclusive property rights. And the literature says a lot of things like, you know, the property uh, which is owned by the state, or it is not a uh, not private property, but at the same time, the, the local community is having a control over it, they are supposed to manage it. So uh, a lot of uh, information you can get from, uh, from, the, uh, from the field. Uh, and we know that because of all these complications, there are a lot of challenges in managing uh, the common property resources because it is not legally indicted to a particular person, or it is not a private property. It is uh, held by a, a group of people Naturally, uh, the regulations are not easy to be implemented over them, and uh, there should be some kind of social legitimacy because they tend to use uh, that uh, that uh, rights uh, are, are usually uh, in a conflict at, at, the, at the large, uh, even almost all parts of the country. And we can see that different types of CPRs can be seen uh, in, in India's uh, different context, especially uh, from. It's, it ranges from community forests to village farms, uh, starts from the food, fuel, order, and, and a lot of things can be can be listed under the CPRs in India's context. But when we break down to Kerala's context, we can see that uh, the common property resources are of probably can be classified into three, where uh, the forests, where the tribal people are, are there, 
and uh, they are using the resources in a larger manner and they use it for their livelihood uh, 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 in the in the day to day life as well as the fisher folk they are using the fossil uh, areas and cost resources but at the same time another resource which we usually need is that of the wetlands the both the inland wetlands as well as uh, the coastal wetlands where uh, all these uh, resources have been used by or it is traditionally used by the marginalized of the or near communal communities of the state naturally when there is some problem or deletion which is occurring in these kind of uh, resources uh, these uh, people or the marginalized societies especially the women the children they will be affected uh, more so uh, i'm, I'm uh, concentrating my discussion only on the wetlands uh, where uh, the, the estimates are showing a, 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 a great deal of picture where uh, we are having something like 2354 uh, wetlands in, in kerala where uh, we have a wide range of uh, wetlands uh, including portfolio rivers Jandina and Manman Reservoirs, then freshwater lakes, and, 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 and so on. But at the same time, even though this much water is there in our uh, state, naturally, uh, when the summer is uh, is soaking up, water becomes a scarce commodity. That, that itself shows that uh, the, there is some problem with the management of, of that kind of resources we are having in our hands. And uh, when we look through the different districts, all the districts are having the wetlands with uh, Narolam and Alipura, uh, is having more uh, distribution, while uh, even Tirunandavaram, Kolla, Patanavita, all the all the districts are having the presence of uh, wetlands. So when we look into the uh, wetland uh, estimates of Tirunandavaram district, uh, we can see only one lake. But that that lake is uh, having a total wetland area of 247 hectares. It is not a, a small one. It is it is a huge freshwater uh, lake which I am trying to uh, bring uh, foot forward, where there are three big freshwater lakes in, in Kerala. The first one is Shastangota Lake, then uh, the Valiani Lake in uh, the Gindam district, and, and the last one is of that of Kuko uh, Lake, where the freshwater lakes play a predominant role in Kerala's natural wealth. In, in, uh, it, it, it is trying to uh, store the precious spring water, and so it, it helps to maintain the groundwater level, and, and a lot of geo, uh, geo, uh, geological uh, advantages are there for uh, this kind of thing. And, and concentrating my discussion or my case study is uh, Belani Lake, which is uh, just designated as a tropical wetland by the scientists, where uh, we can uh, we can get a lot of information about uh, about that particular lake, where uh, it shows uh, a, a, a degradation or a other or the depletion in the in the area over over the years, but you know uh, if you look at the uh, the expanse of the lake itself, the department is having one uh, one uh, one figure, but at the same time the irrigation department is having another figure. So uh, it's everything is contradictory, but at the same time uh, you know what I feel is that it is a common property resource because uh, around the lake there are four panchayats. That four panchayats are supposed to manage the lake. Uh, and uh, that that lake is a source of irrigation, drinking water, uh, the livelihood for the people who are living around uh, uh, around the lake. And naturally, uh, the lake is undergoing rapid transformation due to uh, encroachment, due to uh, indiscriminate cultivation practices, high soil erosion, and, and so on. So the methodology uh, which I have used to uh, used to conduct the study is uh, mainly uh, qualitative in nature. I I I, dis I, I try to uh, have discussion with uh, um, uh, different different people who are there in the different walks of life, uh, uh, starting from the officials of Kerala Water Authority, Panjai Kerala Agricultural University, the department, the people's representatives, farmers, fishermen, and, and so on. So uh, when we uh, when I when I went into the problem, what I could see is that the stakeholders. Of the particular, if you look at only, only from a particular uh, resource, the stakeholders are multiple and varied. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you so how many stakeholders are there. Uh, if it is a freshwater lake, then who are having a claim on it? Uh, the first uh, uh, government agency or, or the stakeholder which we could find is that of the Kerala Water Authority. Because you know, uh, for Water Authority, they want to have a, um, uh, a perennial source of 
water uh, so that you know uh, they can supply to the nearby areas. But then the officials say that it is very difficult to build a, uh, uh, a dam or, or man-made reservoir anywhere in Toronto because it is densely populated. As it is uh, there, we can utilize it, we can properly uh, use it for, uh, for uh, supplying fresh water over the, uh, over the local area. Next uh, stakeholder which I could find is that of the Panjait. Right? Uh, really, uh, the photograph I have put is that you know, the Panjait members, they are, uh, they are uh, staging a strike against the dam or the revenue department because the revenue department uh, wants to take up uh, the, the land or because on the, on the basis of the encroachment of the land. But the Panjait, they want to be with them uh, in that group in order to enhance the, uh, the tourism potential of the uh, they think that the tourism potential in that particular lake is very high and they have a, lot, a whole lot of arguments for that. So that is another stakeholder and naturally the fishermen who are there in the in the locality, they try to make a livelihood uh, of, uh, of with, with the, the source of fish, fish resources that are there in the lake. And uh, another stakeholders which we could meet is that of uh, the farmers. Because you know, it's a freshwater lake. During the summer season, the water level will come down. So naturally, uh, uh, the, uh, the banks of the, of the lake can be easily cultivated. And uh, earlier, what happened was that uh, even the water was dewatered, and, and the lake lands were used for uh, cultivation uh, purposes. But you know, uh, in due course, uh, that is not taking place, and many of the farmers are having land inside the lake. They they face a lot of problems, or they are agitating uh, in order to uh, dewater the lake so that you know they can conduct the uh, cultivation activities. And another stakeholders uh, we can find is that the real estate people, because you know, uh, to have a house, to have a uh, uh, building uh, near the lake. And having a lake that is uh, that is having a very high market value. So uh, many many uh, rich people, bureaucrats, they started buying land uh, near the lake, and they they, they tried to um, reclaim the land. That is another another problem which we can see there. Likewise, the scientists as well as the environmentalists, they are for uh, conserving the lake in order to uh, in order to uh, keep uh, the surroundings uh, the the scenic. Likewise, uh, and uh, there are a lot of proposals coming from different different uh, parts where the fisheries resources, fishery resources, has to be maintained, and and the livelihood of the farmers, sorry, fishermen, should be uh, should be taken care of. That is one proposal. But at the same time, many uh, another group is trying to uh, say something on the water resource. They look only from the water or from the water which is uh, which is there in the. Uh, in the lake, so that you know it has to be conserved uh, in order to have uh, long-term uh, freshwater uh, to meet uh, to meet the demands of the freshwater of, of the people who are who are uh, living uh, around the lake, and and uh, the encroachment has to be prevented, uh, and there should be strict laws and legislations in order to conserve the uh, the lake and and preventing soil erosion and, and so on. My point is that you know whenever there is a lot of conflicts which are occurring in the in, in a particular particular uh, common property, naturally what happens is that the livelihood options are are seen to be declining. Because you know if you are giving more importance to drinking water, naturally uh, there is a uh, problem with paddy cultivation. Because you know we are for uh, are for uh, producing food and the farmers who want to produce uh, uh, rice, they are not in a position because uh, a part of the uh, officials, another a group of people, they, they want to conserve it for the uh, drinking water purpose. And at the same time, you know, another conflict can be seen uh, in the in terms of the ownership, ownership of the land, as well as you know, uh, another group is is always uh, going for the conservation uh, aspect. And uh, even there is a conflict between the conservation and tourism uh, people. You know, the, uh, when when tourism comes to a particular place, naturally it uh, it starts uh, 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 polluting that uh, that lake, and, and that kind of issues are also also taken up. But at the same time, uh, some are some want to have it at uh, have it to conserve the assets, and there is market interest like uh, real estate as well as you know uh, on the other side. A lot of people coming there to just watch the migratory birds and, and, and so on. So uh, with, with this particular case study, I'm coming into some conclusions like you know 
uh, in Kerala, or in general, we can see that the common property resources are threatened of unsustainable harvesting and exploitation. So uh, there should be proper environmental management uh, is needed. And whatever economic planning we are we are we are we, are, we have taken up that lacks the environmental dimensions of development. And the tragedy of commons is uh, is also another issue because you know somebody is there to regulate the common property resources at the at the grassroots level is the panjais. And what we can what we could see in the in the case of panjais is that you know uh, in this particular case there are four panjais and uh, and. The, that four panchayats are coming at it through block panchayats. So uh, they can't take uh, individual residents on their own. And when they go up, uh, that block panchayat or the zilla panchayat or the state governments, they are not that much happy with or interested in conserving that particular uh, issues. Uh, so uh, there is a failure uh, from the part of the government or the, or the institutional failure to be seen in that. But uh, when it comes to environmental uh, issues or uh, when it comes to the common property resources, we can see that all over Kerala, we, there are a number of uh, common property resources which are facing similar problems. I think only a small case in order to uh, bring out what are the conflicts, what are the issues which are there in the uh, in the in the field of common property resources, and the efficient management is needed uh, so that you know uh, this uh, this inefficient uh, environmental management leads to long-term impact rather than uh, short-term impact, not only to the nature, not only to the geography, but to the livelihood of the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. and livelihoods of people. And uh, these are issues which ought to be debated in any uh, forum debating the future of uh, a developing society. So let's, uh, let's uh, take questions from the floor. We have something like uh, five minutes, but then let's say we'll go for another 10 more minutes. So those of you who wish to raise questions, I might have to, to put a stop after a while, but then please feel free to, to but then all of you, please do, please, please do come. And uh, let me also suggest whoever raises a question, please give your name first, or PC for uh, those of them who respond to you, to give it back to you. Thank you. And make it short. I have two questions. Uh, one to the last uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher Nguyen. Um, and uh, I, I, um, actually, my um, question is, can laws and regulation uh, prevent the um, uh, depletion of commons when the lawmakers themselves uh, are uh, uh, pro-development, I mean, agents? And uh, the development, uh, the development, massive development programs are uh, depleting uh, common property resources like anything. Uh, how can we um, uh, depend on the uh, lawmakers to, I mean, how can we rely on the lawmakers to make laws that uh, uh, prevent the uh, depletion of common property resources? And uh, um, uh, to uh, the, the CPR, uh, the depletion of CPR, uh, I think it's been a very, a very prominent issue uh, related to uh, development reduced displacement. Uh, and I think um, uh, the second question is to uh, 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 Dr. Patmini Swaminathan. Um, uh, Ma'am, uh, you said that ASHA workers, they are not being considered as uh, employers, and the uh, I mean the state didn't uh, don't consider them as employers, and uh, they face a lot of uh, issues regarding the tasks they are I mean they are uh, given, uh, but shouldn't this be considered as a uh, essential? Uh, a uh, pain to uh, make a bigger development uh, um, development to happen. Like uh, there are at the grassroots level impact of the ASHA workers should 
cannot be, uh, I mean, uh, cannot be uh, minimized. Uh, it it has a lot of impact. So uh, how can you uh, say that the con uh, uh, just like I mean uh, just by uh, uh, cons not considering them as contract I mean uh, the regular laborers or the uh, employers um, it it uh, doesn't make their development uh, happen I mean a lot of uh, they they are given so so many opportunities when they come I mean they were recruited into uh, the uh, recruited as um, ASHA workers they were given uh, so many skills. So, uh, uh, are, uh, that, is that against the development? Okay, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to sort of try to understand the message which we're trying to give, you know, given the theme of those four years. I mean, are we trying to say that uh, there should be a different type of development which doesn't have to depend on these lakhs and lakhs of women workers, which actually could be done by some more um, you know, regularly employed women workers. Are we saying that or are we saying, yes, we do need them, but then we should give them a fair wage? Is that what we're trying to say? That's it. Bedrani Lake is the case study. I just want to know, uh, when the Adani group came with this Bedrani project, uh, when they submitted the document for environment impact assessment to the Ministry of Environment, they said that they will be taking 40 liters of water from Bellarini Lake per day in the, in the post-operational stage. Whereas the current blueprint of the project, which is held by the engineers, says that we will be taking 1,000 liters of water from Bellarini Lake in the post-operational stage, which is a strict deviance from what they had submitted to the Ministry of Environment. What role can this Panchayats uh, play against such serious violations of the environmental encroachments. Because this is a serious case of a severe violation. Because on record, it is 40 liters of water from the Velayani Lake. And uh, in, on actual terms, it's 1,000 liters. So, what role the Panchayats can play in this big game? Uh, in the post-operational stage, 1,000 liters was uh, uh, perceived. But the Velayani Lake itself is a very small thing, which is not uh, ecologically sustainable for a lake to uh, provide. My name is Lakshmi. I have a question to uh, Anita, ma'am. Uh, in uh, ma'am's pro uh, project, uh, I uh, noticed that I was just curious as to how you evaluated the variable self-confidence and uh, respect from other people for SCSD. And we actually made a comparison between SCSD and uh, non-SCSD females and SCSD males. And also, I have another question to Christopher Rama. Um, I was, again, just a tad bit doubtful as to the terminology used in the word livelihood. Uh, do you mean the catastrophic effects of the daily lives of the people when you mention livelihood or livelihood as in the economic aspect, in the strictest economic sense, as in the working work of the people, like livelihood in that sense? Just the terminology that I just need a clarification. You know, uh, I have uh, some experience with these Ayosha workers and I know that the remuneration varies with different places and PHCs. Because when they collect 100 household data, some were, uh, they are provided with one rupee per household, and some uh, in some places they will be given 50 paise per household. Uh, so in such a situation, there is a um, system, there is a need for a system to ensure the remuneration to these ASHA workers. Even the burden of work not only increased with the welfare programs, increased welfare programs of the government, these ASHA workers are in the bottom of the PHC system, that before that, the JPHNs had the highest burden of collecting data from the field and providing these awareness measures and all. So in such a system, a strong um, system to ensure the remuneration is a need. And again, uh, the midday meal schemes and Anganwadi uh, programs and this ASHA workers, these uh, stress the need for health concerns as well as, uh, um, I mean, eliminating the uh, uh, nutrition uh, related uh, pro problems like malnutrition issues and all. 
If the government ensures minimum wage as it is given for NREG as a all, these programs will definitely have a dual effect of health concerns and again eliminating malnutrition with gender uh, equality. What is your uh, opinion on that? Thank you. Actually, I have a few questions. Uh, so, first we have Padmi ma'am. You mentioned about the other workers. Uh, I want to know whether they are in quotas or what is the work that has to be done to remain a member of this ASHA uh, as an ASHA worker? And uh, I'm not clear about the 20 works and 5 P thing uh, you mentioned. Then about the para teachers. Uh, uh, the question is what are para teachers basically? And uh, is it a formal organization or are there any permanency of work in this? And then there's uh, the question regarding the heterogeneity of women's movement. Uh, what do we mean by heterogeneity of women's movement? And then there's the question regarding the confinement of women to homes with upward movement. Is it voluntary or pressured? And uh, uh, the next question is regarding the gender mainstreaming. Again, that is about what it is generally. Uh, like basically, and next question is for Anita, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, you mentioned about most of the women being in uh, low class or low caste. Uh, actually, want to clarify what uh, on what point you what basis did you make that uh, point? And um, second is regarding the life satisfaction approach. And I don't know how pertinent it can be or how effective it can be. And uh, the next set of questions for Christabella ma'am. Um, first question is outlier communities. What are outlier communities? And uh, second is which stakeholder, you mentioned a few stakeholders in it, and which stakeholder basically is less harmful to this, uh, to the system, to the society, uh, to the resources, and how to manage. And Godwin, my question is Dr. Pagdini. Uh, <clears throat> my concern is actually a simple one. Uh, when we position the social sector in, in, in India from a public finance perspective, uh, particularly along with the defense segment, we know that the defense is getting much more priority because the rate of growth of uh, budgetary allocation every year, as well as the overall quantum of budget uh, towards the defense sector, is far, far greater than that of the social sector and specifically take the case of health, excluding the social, the rural development parts. So, uh, don't you think, you know, the until the health or the social sector gets a political priority, uh, these kind of, you know, issues would always remain as a uh, long-term development issue, right? <clears throat> because, you know, health minister always is a low-profile person, just to ref at, a, at a kind of reflection and, you know, always the senior or the, the most coveted post belongs to the defense minister, right? That's just a reflection of the role stuff. This question is to Padmi, ma'am. Ma'am, have you looked into the duplication of work between Anganwadi? Duplication of work between Anganwadi workers and the Asha workers. So it seems there is no burden, but there is rather a duplication of work between both of them. My question is for Padmi, ma'am. Uh, in the present Kerala context, the middle class parents, most of the middle class parents are those who have uh, or those who have had the development experience, they have had the educational development also. But what is seen, they have also moved upward in the social ladder. But what is seen nowadays is that they are insisting their daughters to get married off or uh, mainly to start their education at a very uh, young age. So does it seem to be really contradictory? They have enjoyed, they have moved up the social ladder, but they are restricting their future generation to uh, remain on the same ladder. Doesn't it seem to be contradictory? That's my question. Thank you. Let's try to run. My question is to Professor Swaminathan. Hello. When you look at the, the national level or the state level or the panchayat or the local level, 
when you look at the judiciary and the, the executive and the legislature, women don't feature more. Women chief ministers, women ministers, women directors. And, the, and the, I think the population is around 52% in case of, care, of women. Why are they not featuring? Does it mean they're not there or they're not capable? Or why? We don't see them. Then the, the second question is on, on Dr. Madame Krista Bell. When you, when you are raising the issues about the environment, you see the water body, the environment, the, sorry, the, the leader, these are the people coming from the same system, same arrangement, same government, same department, but they are contradicting between themselves according to the presentation. I fail to understand, because I, I, I assume that if you are, you are head of a culture, you, you must be having the same understanding with the, the whole chain. Why do we get the same contradiction from the same system? My name is Nitka. My question is to Patna Ima. Like, when you were uh, telling about ASHA workers, you were uh, putting upon words like marginalized and poor people who are being taken from the uh, low strata of the society. Like, and one more term, like the social injustice that is being done to them, they are not paid according to the work that they are doing. They are supposed to do the 20 functions and they, uh, like, they are just paid for the five functions that they are doing. So my question is like, uh, like Professor A.V. Jones so was quoting out a thing like, the real, in, I mean, we have to actually focus upon skill development pro programs and other things that will actually empower people and, you know, make them more uh, better individuals to be employed in the, you know, labor market. So, the real injustice that is being done to them is to still, you know, even when we are at the plight of development, we still are putting them in the so-called marginalized section and we are not thinking about anything like bringing them up or uh, you know um, giving them more skill development pro I mean uh, projects or other things that will make them better individuals so that they can be really absorbed with the labor market. So I would like to get comments upon this from you. I am aware of the time and I don't pretend to answer all the questions. Uh, let me start with the question that. Uh, Bridal has started because that is bang on what I was trying to do. And that is, she asked the question is, what is the message of the entire presentation? Are you questioning, you know, in relation to the team? And that is precisely the point. The point is, uh, the seminar is actually titled The Development Question in a Developing Economy. And using this, the all of us, you know, are using different entry points to actually question the coming to the theme of the seminar and that is uh, when one is looking at uh, some of these particular issues, the, the question of gender, the question of uh, uh, development. I am uh, uh, also saying that it is also actually questioning where our development is going or how are we conceptualizing our development. And the theme that I was trying to do is uh, the development question is also the gender question, the development question is also the labor question, right? So that is that is the standpoint from where I am coming. There have been a number of questions on uh, uh, on the ASHA workers, um, uh, right? Uh, so the point about using the case study of the ASHA workers is also to also to bring forth. Oh, I, I uh, uh, you know I I myself have not done, for example, the kind of field work that I quoted. This I quoted from the different papers who have done field work because to prove a particular kind of point that I was trying to actually say. Uh, the point, the larger point is there is an official speak on the uh, uh, from uh, uh, on the ASHA workers or the ASHA workers as part of the social. So if this country thinks that health is a very important sector, and that is the point that you're also trying to say, that today health, education are, are welfare sectors. They are sectors where the budget cut, the budgetary cuts would be the first if the, if the, if the in, uh, country faces a resource crunch. If that is a priority we give, then nothing much is going to happen actually uh, on the ground. So, 
So coming back to the theme is the our concept of development. So if these are very important priority sectors, then the people who work and are making that health and education happen, right, who are contributing to that, uh, uh, need also to be looked at under what circumstances are they actually performing the task that they are that they are actually doing. So, so therefore, it is it is from that perspective that one is looking at the Ashka workers. Uh, I will not be able to answer all the questions that our friend here asked me about who are para teachers, who what is you know all of this because that would require uh, a lecture in women's studies uh, and that 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 should be reserved for another day. Uh, but uh, 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 but the point, but, but the point is that on the ground, when you are capturing and you are trying to find out what are the different kinds of responsibilities that has been put on people like the ASHA workers, and that is what I was trying to say is that by their own listing and by the listing of their supervisors, they have 20 different kinds of responsibilities which have been thrust on them. And what they are being compensated for is only five of these particular responsibilities. And I also preface it by saying that this study has been done in a large scale survey done in Maharashtra. So the point is that it could be very differently done in different parts of the, because this actually comes under the state also. So, but this is the thing that study, and if we have to actually generalize from that particular study, we will have to do large more, you know, far more empirical studies. And I think that should be the responsibility of not individual researchers. It should be the responsibility of the state to actually conduct these kinds of large scale, uh, uh, large scale uh, 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 studies. Uh, the question is, then then if you do this across the country, you may come across the kind of thing that you're talking, is that how much of it is duplication and how much of it is being done individually, right? For the moment, what we have is that we have the category of Anganwadi workers, and in many states, they are separate from the ASHA workers, right? If ASHA workers doubled up as Anganwadi workers, or Anganwadi workers, are there, that is a different point of view, but I'm, I'm not very sure that happens in every state. So, but that has to be, that is an empirical question and that has to be actually uh, camp, uh, uh, captured uh, uh, this day. To the question of why do women not figure in, in so many different, you know, in high force and all that. Uh, uh, once again, that's a larger question. It is not something unique to this country, right? Women don't figure in so many other countries, the developed countries also don't figure in so many different, uh, uh, this thing. Uh, the question is not of capability because uh, once again, where is the where, where is the nature of empirical work that has been done to actually capture this kind of capability? The second issue that I want to do is that I just quickly with a uh, with a small this thing that I wanted to also leave you with that thought is that is that when 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 the, when the seventy uh, 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 third and the seventy fourth amendment took place and a large number of women had to mandatorily be as part of Panchayat Raj this thing. Within no time, we started having a large number of studies. We started saying, you know, these women who are there, they are the wives of so-and-so, they are the, uh, you know, girlfriends of so-and-so, they are this, they are that, they don't have any experience and so on and so forth. And this is something where, uh, uh, where you're not even giving time for these women to, you know, to understand what is there. You've just thrust a large number of women into the public space and within no time, you're expecting the women to perform where these men have been there in the public space for the last 60 years, have ruined the country, and you're expecting these women in about one year to actually undo what has actually been. So let them do it. If they want, if they, are, if they are doing it in the next five years, they're going the country, let them do. It has been ruined for so long. What does it matter if for another five years, the women, you know, stumble and bumble and tumble, you know, whatever it is, let them do it, you see? So why are we expecting them to, you know, perform within no time? Right? So, so it is not that question of capability. Where did the men get their capability? There are large numbers of men who are so incapable. Why are they continuing? Right? So why doesn't the system get rid of them and put in, you know, get this kind of a uh, So there are different kind of questions that we need to ask. Because what we are always doing is, we are always asking the same kind of questions and putting a large number of men, or, or women and girls in a very defensive position. And I don't think that should be the message that comes from the center. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't. Have, there was one question that was given to me. Again, it was to do with uh, a written question that was given. 
uh, again, he asks about there are not many women in R&D positions uh, in scientific establishments. My, my, uh, this thing is, yes, again, it requires uh, a much more detailed discussion about uh, uh, this thing. And there have been quite a lot of studies about, uh, uh, you know, what is it that conditions certain kinds of women from not entering these uh, particular kind of institutions. Uh, if, if we don't find people at that higher level, we also need to look down the line to see how many opportunities or how many women are able to get over so many struggles to actually read those kinds of positions. Then only one will be able to see why there are so few women in some of these positions. Thank you. In the question self-confidence, see this is a, all, most of the variables are related to subjectivity or you know, the subjective aspects. So we, I have used more than two questions to validate each question. So regarding the self-confidence, self the first question I have used is how you rated your confidence yourself. Then three point is scale is new one. Then in order to validate that question, again I have used another question, can you solve the problems of the society by asking, by um, pointing out some problems in the local society and then gives three options, yes very easily, second yes with great difficulty and then no, not at all. So these are the three uh, options and based on this I have a, 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 a collected the value for the self-confidence. Then uh, again, uh, the uh, respect from the other, uh, respect, uh, respect from others. Three questions are again asked for, uh, for the particular individual. Uh, the one, one is related to uh, respect from the family, respect from the society, and respect from the co members. So on the basis of the three cat uh, questions, I have finalized the values. Then uh, um, the questions related to puja, low caste and low class. See, the low caste is we can clearly uh, seen from the constitutional provision. So there is a demographic representation for the scheduled caste and scheduled caste. So the majority comes from the scheduled caste and scheduled caste. And again, in the case of low class, we can see that the majority of the studies related to the Panjaitaraj the representatives, their income, their income group shows that their income category shows that it is far below from the uh, per capita income of each state. Then, and then the life satisfaction, that's the very uh, very psychological or subjective well-being aspects. Uh. See, if you go through the literature, literature related to the life satisfaction, actually this concept was used, uh, used by the psychologist from earlier. But the economists used this concept recently. So in order to prove the, uh, uh, the uh, differences in the uh, psychological well-being or the life satisfaction, there are scientific studies related to this concept. Uh. And uh, there are two methodology adopted by different agencies. One is self-reported survey, and another one is the electroencephalography. That is a uh, scientific method by measuring uh, our phys uh, physiological aspects with our uh, cognitive level. So uh, then uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, economists. They use the self-reported surveys, and they proved that uh, it is we can use it uh, uh, to compare the individual. Uh, individual level uh, satisfaction and we can use it to compare for the interpersonal uh, utility or the interpersonal satisfaction level. But the study by uh, Frey and Dutton, they proved that it is better to use in the case of group comparison. So we can give better result in the case of group comparison uh, uh, compared to the interpersonal comparison. Then again, uh, detail. We can also use it to uh, assess uh, the, uh, the satisfaction level he uh, compared the two satisfaction levels, emotional happiness and the life satisfaction. See, our aim is to uh, assess the value of life satisfaction. See, emotional, uh, emotional satisfaction is related to particular uh, incidents or something like that. So in order to prepare the questionnaires, uh, by, and the, by the rule the regarding the preparation of the questionnaires is that we should, uh, uh, at most care should be given to ask the life satisfaction ladder. That means the 10, uh, uh, 10 point scale or the 10, point, uh, 10 steps in the ladder, we should, uh, we should take utmost care to ask that question. Otherwise, it will be uh, influenced by the emotional aspects or something like that. Then, okay, we start the Thank you for your questions. I'll uh, club uh, three questions together, starting from Joshua's question. 
where you know uh, what we can see in India or Kerala, we have a multiplicity of agencies to uh, to look into a particular uh, common property issues. You know, I'll, I'll take this example itself. You know, uh, this lake is uh, that land belongs to the revenue department. Okay, but that water uh, that is taken care by the irrigation. But at the same time, uh, the management or, or uh, the, uh, the overall function has to be done by the panchayats. That is coming under the local uh, local survey department. Okay, so a lot of departments uh, are are there. There is no integration between uh, among these departments, so that you know uh, the conservation or or any other uh, type of management is is not that much easy in our in our situation. That is. Uh, your question and, and for Shamir, uh, I have um, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with you, or I am coming with you, but at the same time, there the laws and regulations are needed. Otherwise, you know, nothing will be there at the, at the end of the day. So it plays a very important, uh, significant role. What I feel is that the legislations play a very important role because the government owns everything. So uh, that should be there. But as I told earlier, uh, the different departments. Their policies are contradicting. That naturally, you know, uh, is is going to deplete, degrade, or inefficient management of the resources. That is what I feel. And uh, regarding Anila, there, I think there is a small mistake in the quantity of water, or something like that. I, I'll, I'll I'll come back to it. Okay, let me finish. Uh, and when it comes to the livelihood person, actually, my my the word which I have used is not livelihood. It is livelihood options. Okay, so uh, in this particular case study, what I could uh, found is that if you are a farmer, you farm during the farming season. What will you do in the rest of the period? At that time, you go for fishing. Or at the same time, you have some cows which you use that uh, uh, that fodder in order to uh, have a livelihood. Okay, so you have different uh, options. In traditional society, it is like that. You are not having a particular advantage. You can't say one person as a farmer or a fisherman, nothing like that. They will be doing different uh, different options when they on fail to uh, give them food. They, they try something else. So when these resources uh, fail or they degrade, naturally the options will be coming down. So that you know they will be falling back to the poverty. That is what I try to make. And and, uh, and and following to that, you know, the panchayats they try to introduce the tourism also in order to provide employment opportunities for people. So that is also another option. It is not a bad option. Okay, as an economist is concerned. And when it comes to the uh, outlier communities, uh, see, uh, it is a statistical word. You know, the outlier is it is uh, some value which is falling uh, above or below the the average. Okay, so when you uh, when you take the social indicators, you can see that. The Kerala uh, social indicators of Kerala is very high because you know you are averaging together, you are, you are putting it together, then the average is high. But at the same time, some communities, some uh, social uh, classes, their values are still low, or uh, or the uh, the rates are entirely different from that other mainstream. So that communities can be identified as outlier communities, usually the fisher folk or other Tamil uh, plantation workers. If you look through the data, you can see that their, uh, their values are entirely different from that of the mainstream population. And the stakeholders. The stakeholders means, you know, whoever are there to use the resources. They are called the stakeholders or, or who are uh, gaining out of the particular resources. Whenever you use the resources, naturally, you'll be doing harm. But it should be, you know, optimal of, uh, utilization of resources. That is what an economist has to uh, argue for. Thank you. Friends, it was a very rewarding session. We discussed extremely sensitive issues in an air of great dignity and respect for all people involved in that, which is a very commendable achievement. And I think Patmini raised very, very pertinent issues about the very process of creating an underclass of civil servants, paying them mm, awful wages uh, subhuman terms and conditions and um, trying to make them uh, taking advantage of the kind of pressure exerted in the labor market from the supply side 
and uh, it's it, it comes very close to creation of uh, to to the uh, to the employment of contract workers in the manufacturing enterprises things which we seem to be very proud of now but then let's be aware of the fact unless we are able to hire people at terms and conditions that give them dignity and respect which they legitimately deserve this model is just not sustainable and thank you for raising that issue. And I must say, the other two presenters, they also, they are commendable, admirable for the kind of depth of understanding of the issues and for explaining very complex methodological issues in a, in, in a, in a very elegant manner, making it known to you the kind of approaches they adopted and the process raising serious issues of concern to the society. And it was a very, very useful session. Thank you. Thanks to all of you who took part in it, and uh, to the person, to the to the speakers for raising pertinent issues, and those of you who raised questions. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. I invite Gauri to propose a vote of thanks. Good afternoon. I thank Professor A. V. for his uh, uh, commendable task of presiding over the second technical session on development issues in India. The session was marked by strong female voices, and the key address given by Professor Patni uh, Swaminathan had brought our attention to the issues of uh, uh, the women working for development, but the converse not happening, and the irony of education playing a retrogressive role in the social mobility of women. Thank you, ma'am. And I also thank the presenters, uh, Dr. Anita and Dr. Christabel, for the commendable work and the audience for the active participation. Now, I invite everyone uh, for the lunch being served, I would say, and kindly uh, uh, noted that you have to uh, uh, assemble back by 2 o'clock sharp for the third technical session. <laughs>